ಹಲೋ ಮೇಡಮ್ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದೆಯಾ ಹಲೋ ಹಲೋ ಓಕೆ ಫೈನ್
share the screen and let us know. Sir, you can, can you share the screen, sir? Hello? Hello, sir. Ah, really? Sir, you can, can you share the screen, sir? Hello, sir. Ah, really? Sir, you can, can you share the screen, sir? I will close my Share the screen. Stop sharing. Share the screen. How share screen? You will not accept it. Share the screen. Already, the number is so please share the screen. Ah, yes, sir. Ah, okay. So, you got video on it. So, stop, mother, the video. Stop, stop. Stop, start. Let both of them be. Stop. Good afternoon to one and all. I am Sunita, professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, SIT Tumkur, coordinating this session today. A warm welcome to all the participants, faculty, staff, students, research scholars, and industry persons to the second session of webinar series, IT Industry Trends on AI in Software Engineering. I cordially invite Mr. Mahesh B. R. Pandit, founder and CEO, Ritipai Technologies, as speaker to this session. We all are aware that AI is transforming all business functions, and software development is no exception. We now have models that can deduce from data what features and patterns are important without a programmer explicitly encoding this knowledge. Yes, AI in software engineering is a wonderful domain to understand and explore. Before we start the session, let me introduce today's speaker, Mr. Mahesha B. R. Pandit. Mr. Mahesha B. R. Pandit is founder and CEO of Ritipai Technologies, which focuses on developing AI and NLP-based platforms and products. Mr. Mahesha Biyar is a global thought leader, MIT Sloan alumnus, mentor for startups, senior executive, and a hands-on techie who can create energy and drive transformation within an enterprise. I'm proud to mention that Mr. Mahesha is a distinguished alumnus of our department who secured fourth rank in his UG program under Bangalore University. He did his master's program from Bits Pilani. He pursued an executive program in general management from MIT Sloan. He is currently pursuing his PhD from Chitkara University, Punjab, and two micro masters, namely AI and bioinformatics from edX. Mr. Mahesha's 22 years of global software industry experience spans across multiple domains, including manufacturing, automotive, aerospace, financial services, media and entertainment, education, government IT, and pharmacovigilance. He has served multiple global market customers, including Bosch, Infosys, Airbus, Capgemini, UK and India, Value Labs, Aris Global, Salesforce, Unilever, Johnson & Johnson, and many more. He was a consultant to UK government's technology strategy board and has helped UK businesses to adopt cloud computing. He's also an advisor to few engineering colleges. His focus areas include artificial intelligence, model-driven software engineering, 
rapid application development, software defects reduction, and digital governance. His keen interest is in disruptive innovation, NLP, software modernization, designing, and building effective software. He is recognized as a most valuable player by Infosys, cloud expert by UK government's TSP, and global expert on cloud technologies by Capgemini. Mahesha is passionate about writing, oil painting, travel, and teaching. Yes, this afternoon we have a very knowledgeable industry expert with us. Now I request Mr. Mahesha to take over and start the session on AI in software engineering. Over to you, Mr. Mahesh. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to share what little I know on uh, AI. Um, that's a long introduction. Yeah, uh, thank you for this opportunity so, to share what little I know. Just uh, when I put up the first slide, you must have noticed that uh, I think there is a small voice delay in the software uh, in the platform. So let's just. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are able to see the screen. There is no problem. Okay. So, uh, just uh, share my screen. Are you able to see the PowerPoint slide? The first slide. Okay, just a minute. This PowerPoint, uh, there is a little bit of problem. I'll convert it to PDF and uh, I'll show. Them. Okay, so uh, like uh, Sunita mentioned, uh, I'm uh, I studied, I did my uh, studies at SIT, and uh, those were the best days of my uh, student life. Um, maximum homework I have done is at SIT. So our school used to run like a, you know, uh, ashram. <laughs> it used to start at 7.30 in the morning, 7.30 to 9.30, then 10 to 12, and then 2 to 4, 5, and sometimes some special labs used to run between 5 and, uh, sorry, 5.30 and 8.30. So I have not seen this kind of dedication uh, anywhere else in any other uh, economic institution. So I'm proud to be uh, uh, alumni of SIT and have warm memories of SIT and uh, I wish the very best for the college and faculty uh, of uh, SIT. Um, yeah, so a little bit about my company, Rightify. We are uh, uh, guided by uh, MIT Sloan School of uh, Entrepreneurship, Mark Interest Center. And uh, we have uh, recently rec been recognized as the collaborative research partner by Bharat Electronics in cloud computing. So at last, uh, until now, we used to say we are good people. Now, at least there's one com one public sector unit which has recognized our uh, uh, niche skills in uh, cloud. Um, today, Okay, this is a brief look at our uh, uh, development center. We have a nice uh, facility here in Bangalore, close to our metro. And these are some of the people who uh, work with us, my uh, staff. Uh, we are a small team. We, we are driven by integrity, innovation, and detail orientation. So uh, we try to do Every, we look at details of everything and try to um, we have a healthy disrespect for what is uh, normal. So we try to do things as much as possible in a different uh, way. Um, so we have done a lot of uh, 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 focus areas we have and we have done a few things in these things. Uh, computational biology, bioinformatics, cloud, uh, interaction between uh, humans and robots, uh, e-governance. We have some some of these uh, focus areas we are trying to understand and uh, provide uh, new solutions 
in these areas. We have a tie up with uh, uh, Subaya Research Center. That's uh, they own the Max Hospital in uh, Shiomaga. So we are together solving some um, uh, problems related to medical artificial intelligence. Um, E-governance is one area where we are trying to uh, add some value. We have recently created a solution to govern research uh, within uh, Indian uh, academic setup. So uh, we keep doing things. And coming to today's topic, I'm passionate about AI as well as software engineering. I would like to develop software that is defect free, free from all the defects. So in this area, we built a, a solution called review as a service. Once uh, the customer uploads a review uh, item, whether it could be an uh, architecture or code or anything, so our bot does a pre-review. Uh, and then a human reviewer provides his comment. So we are trying to experiment here in this space, how, how much AI we can do, use to do uh, to review technical artifacts. So this is one small piece. We have began our journey in AI and software engineering. You must have seen this first slide. I don't know how many of you saw this first slide. So I've written a code here. So once I wake up while we are alive, you know, we need to do this. We have to ignore this AI noise. There is so much noise about AI. It is really uh, frustrating. Everybody wants AI, ML. Uh, as if you cannot separate those two words. The moment you utter the word AI, you, the next thing you have to say is ML. <laughs> you know, they go together like AI, ML, AI, ML. Whether it's a, a small time intern or a small time researcher or, or an expert, uh, industry expert or a marketing, everyone talks about AI. So in my opinion, there's a lot of noise about AI and misplaced uh, understanding and uh, uh, high expectations uh, and disregard for data. There are so many issues I see, but I'm also excited about what AI can do. So in my opinion, AI, I'm happy with the, uh, I'm comfortable with the definition that it is augmented intelligence. That is what it is uh, at its current stage. It can help us. So it is not gonna replace um, any of the uh, normal functions that we do. We are far from that. But yes, it will replace many of the routine things that we do, like status inquiry from a bank or those kind of things, you know, like you can automate and you can predict what the customer can do on your platform and those kind of things. But it always augments our current intelligence. So what our focus area here is to bend our heads down and just keep innovating and publishing. So that's the um, model we subscribe to. So this is how the session I've planned today. So I'll explain some myths about uh, AI and software engineering. Then we will look at some use cases. Um, and then we'll take a little bit deeper look at uh, how you can predict software defects using AI. And then I'll take the question and answers at the end. So I request for you to hold your horses until you, uh, and until we go through the first three sessions, um, because your answer, could, your question could be answered in, in my next slide itself. So I'm gonna take about uh, an hour or hour and 10 minutes. Um, I'll try to wrap it up by four, 10 minutes past four, so that we can have some 20 minutes for the question and answers. So let's begin with the myths. You know, there are some statements, you know, we, people keep saying these kind of things. If you are in marketing, you will know this. Black is the new blue color. Perception is reality. You have to lose in order to win. So these are all, you know, <laughs> very uh, tricky uh, things. You will never know whether something is a myth or a reality. So that's my belief. So with that uh, introduction, I would like to introduce, uh, ask you if possible, if there is a polling feature on this uh, uh, platform, we can take a quick poll. 
we can take one by one. So first myth is AI can do little in software engineering. This one, um, many people have told me that there are no use cases in AI in software engineering, for AI in software engineering. And uh, some of my academic friends, they were asking, hey, do you have any problem statements for my PhD students in AI and software engineering? You know, the subject is so dry and all. So is there a polling feature, ma'am, on this uh, platform? I no, sir, it's only okay. Yeah. So most of the people do believe that uh, the first point, AI can do little in software engineering, is a current um, belief uh, amongst many uh, people, uh, definitely practitioners. At least academicians are slightly optimistic, uh, but they're also uh, believing that there are not many topics to uh, apply AI. Um, so it is largely a myth. Reality is you can do a lot of things with AI. I'll show you in the next uh, section what they are. And then uh, there is a general belief that AI can write software by itself. So this is, what, this is what many people say, hey, be afraid of AI. It can generate software by itself and then it can take over the world and all. Fortunately, right now it is a myth, but it could be true in the next 50 years or so. Um, software models can be classified as defective. Um, Somebody told me that we software defects are a natural part of software. There is no software that is not defective. So why do you want to predict using, why do you need AI to predict? Where, whereas common sense itself says that if you develop 100 modules, there is 100% chance that at least 90% of them contain at least one defect. So this is the sorry state of software engineering. It is true also, defects, uh, it's the nature of this software, is it's a highly cognitive work product. So software does have defects, although there are many ways to reduce those defects. But uh, the, the question here is, can, using AI, can you classify a software module as defective or non-defective? This is not a myth, you can do that. You can classify modules as defective or not defective. The next question is, can you count the esti estimate the number of defects per module? For example, there is a security module. Can you guess how many defects? Guess is the wrong word. Or can you estimate how many defects are going to be there in the software uh, security part? Similarly, login module, authentication module, how many defects? This is also not a myth. You can actually, there are techniques to count and estimate the number of defects that uh, they are likely to be there in your end product. Module by module, you can estimate the defect count. The last one is interesting. We have enough defects data for AI to work on. You know, AI needs data, right? Without data, AI, you have to rely on deep learning. But you may not have enough um, uh, insights to build um, deep learning solutions. So you definitely need the effects data. But who is sharing defects data? None of these industries, we don't share. We don't share, uh, you know, we are lucky uh, if we are storing those defects data. We use tools, techniques, sometimes we outsource testing. We get only summary results like, okay, there were 14 defects, we have fixed all 14 of them. Such messages we get but we don't get defect data. And even if we get it, we keep it within the company. We don't release it outside. So then how do we do research on AI and software engineering? So the fifth one is a kind of a, a, a myth, but it is slowly becoming reality. There are good people out there who are sharing defect data. For example, NASA, Eclipse, these projects, they are freely releasing the defect data on which uh, researchers like me rely to run our prediction algorithms. So, so this is the current uh, state. So with this, let's see what AI can do in software engineering. See, the, there are some people who say AI can help in software engineering in many ways. When we don't know who said it, the general practice is to assign it to Mark Twain. 
the unfortunate fellow who 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 did say many things in uh, english so feel free to associate uh, the quotation to mark twain if you don't know who said it okay so here are some boring use cases and some interesting use cases so uh, these are the uh, use cases as per a famous american company i don't want to take names here so i am you know just kidding uh, classified them as uh, boring and interesting I just wanted to keep this webinar a bit uh, light uh, so there are some poor jokes so just <laughs> excuse me <laughs> so the use cases from the management perspective ai helps planning the staff that you have on the actual software development work it is more or less technical but it's you know i can quote one example here i was working for a, an american airline industry they were an airline carrying millions of passengers across america and the world they had a, a very complex um, it system which had ticketing reservation flight scheduling cargo even uh, uh, allowing passengers into the aircraft scanning the boarding pass there were many many functions the were, were were being done there were 16 modules so they had 16 teams one for each module and every tuesday they used to integrate their code and all hell used to break loose on uh, on tuesdays when everyone brings their code and integrates together confusion there were a lot of you know many things failed that's what happens when you merge code in software there will be side effects so such complex cases the ai can predict things and they can allocate work um, across teams and ensure that uh, um, you know the chaos is uh, minimized so though it is management stuff there is uh, uh, enough room to deploy ai there next one is uh, transforming old technology to new technology uh, this is one passionate area for me because uh, I, we started it very long i think in 99 we started transforming cobol code to java and all 99 2000 that's when the java had made its first entry in fact my company name rightify is derived from this uh, uh, transformation of legacy systems i have uh, some uh, ip in uh, converting old code to new code so uh, i was looking for a name for that and uh, transforming old to new the medical procedure is called as uh, rightidectomy um, so that is plastic surgery uh, people undergo plastic surgery in order to look young so that's why i kept uh, the name uh, rightify uh, for that product and when i started my company i used the same uh, uh, name but unfortunately not many big investments are coming in legacy transformation uh, so all hopefully with ai we are able to unlock uh, some money in this area uh, we do pitch in a lot of legacy transformation uh, proposals but uh, it is not gaining much of traction okay third one is identification of duplicate code this is very important because most of the developers they just import things copy uh, code from google then they check in and there are hundreds of branches on git so this is a nightmare so across uh, software uh, your your uh, complex software if you can identify duplicate code and uh, avoid uh, uh, few repeated merges and all you can save a lot of complexity the other thing is uh, which is uh, which no one cares much about is benchmarking how good is my code against uh, say that of amazon uh, now there is a very good uh, security system in uh, amazon e-commerce platform so how is my e-commerce platform compared to uh, the other top 3 e-commerce platforms of the world but not many people care about this but this is a very interesting and valuable application only when you benchmark your software against the best in the industry only then your uh, journey towards the betterment begins 
the fifth one is really boring and i i definitely i don't know i don't know whether it is true or false using ai for uh, predicting expenses and costs this might look like a joke but uh, if you are a, a large company like infosys or google you know these could be very significant because you should be able to predict the expenses and costs of your employees and also your hardware especially in the cloud context just today we got an inquiry someone asked hey i want a netflix alternative alternative to netflix i want to exactly build a software that exactly looks like netflix it has to have all the features of netflix but i don't know how many users will be using it so in this case how do i give the proposal i can give it for building this software but what will be the run cost month on month how much is the cost incurred by the uh, customer i don't know so we need models here to predict expenses and costs but when you apply that to employee expenses and travel expenses and those kind of things yes the problem looks like a joke but it believe me it is not none of these are um, they appear different but uh, they do add value and there are paying customers for these uh, use cases now let's look at something more technical you know most of us are techies i assume so we are more interested in source code complexity predicting faults or defects estimating the quality of the software not only this we want to understand how the software can fail where is the risk in my code uh, recently we are building an e-commerce platform and a, and a lift elevator maintenance system both of them use credit card data so i'm i'm nervous now i want to know where and how this can fail because there are hackers out there waiting to crack into our credit card data and though people say credit card validation payment gateway integration is only few lines of code and all but the key thing is where do i keep the credit card validation data called pci data your platform is it pci data compliant if so how this is not good if so what kind of controls we have on one hand i need to know that and on the other hand i need to know how bad is my code where is going to how is it going to fail and the what circumstance and what risk i am carrying so these are some of the uh, uh, current use cases of course there are so many others like you can predict the effectiveness of testing coverage of uh, uh, you know source code coverage from your testing uh, you can predict uh, uh, vulnerabilities uh, based on the behavior of your behavior and expertise level of your staff you can extend each of these uh, uh, use cases and uh, create a lot more now let's look at uh, one area which is which is right now i'm doing my research on this and we are also building a solution for this is predicting defects uh, so i you know software defects are killing people we don't know about it and definitely we are wasting a lot of money this is what uh, uh, this is what i'm putting up i don't know how, how how big number is this yeah it's 213 lakh crore it is 10 times the covid package announced by our uh, current government yeah so this is a loss that we are incurring per year this is this much of money we are losing every year due to software defects that is 2.84 trillion dollars if uh, any nris who want to see the world in through the dollars um, yeah 2.84 can you believe it it's true and software defects are causing more damage software is everywhere there are 36 billion devices that run software half of the world is online the billions of lines of code okay the software people have lost a lot of money nasa lost its mars orbiter we lost our moon landing in chandrayaan arian 5 rocket exploded 
just a minute i'll close the window here there's some noise yeah i'm back arian 5 rocket explosion was due to a software defect nasa mars orbiter was lost because the software did not calculate the distance properly there was unit of measure mistake you know i'm talking about meters and feet so one module was uh, calculating uh, distance in meters the other one in feet these are legends i don't know whether they are uh, true or not but definitely it was due to a measurement mistake okay arian 5 caused huge losses 8 billion and in russia ukraine side there was a huge explosion of gas pipe that is the largest known non nuclear explosion explosion that was caused by a software defect so the world spent spends about 4 trillion dollars um, but out of that 2.84 trillion is lost it goes into fixing the software defects okay so 17% of your spend going into this is is quite a quite a huge number no this one so that is uh, enough motivation for us to use any available technology to minimize defects so this field is called as sdp software defect prediction some people also call it as dep defect prediction so the objective is to identify software module that may contain at least one defect so that is classifying modules as defective or non defective and also estimate the number of defects so people have visualized an ideal sdp model and they have described it like this it should be able to classify defects on the basis of severity so i don't it's not enough if you tell me that the authentication module has defects it should tell me authenticate module is likely to have 13 defects out of which five are going to be major seven are going to be minor and one is going to be an observation kind of thing so it should be able to give me that severity and also security related defects because the world of hacking is becoming more and more sophisticated okay so we need to isolate and identify security relation related defects as early as possible in the life cycle and not only defects also the vulnerabilities where the code is likely open for attack and abuse and i have to do all these things on a system on which nobody has trained the system for example i have to be able to predict defects in my program using the defect prediction data of nasa so that is the expectation here cross project defect prediction see i i don't have time to train my model on defect prediction first of all i don't have data second is uh, you know I, i don't know how to build uh, all these uh, uh, models i can't build it build a model for every project i'm a commercial software company so the expectation here is give me a model which was which is already pre trained it could be trained on nasa's mars orbiter or isro's uh, moon lander software so that i have to take and predict defects in my e-commerce project okay i think so that is the expectation cross project the defect prediction should happen across companies across projects and uh, across different releases of the project so if there is a a defect prediction model which delivers all these things that is our ideal that is our goal at least the goal should be high enough like this so that we can work towards it initially it looks very difficult to achieve yes everything is difficult at first but this is the gold standard for defect prediction using ai so where does it fit in stp in the whole lot of things you know we know only about some standard things so the right hand side is the software engineering bubble the left hand side is the artificial intelligence bubble so we are talking about software engineering and ai coming together 
So we have machine learning as a subfield of AI and verification validation as a subfield of software engineering. In that, we are looking at evolutionary learning of uh, AI and which focuses on prediction and testing of the software engineering side. So that is where the uh, innovation is taking place. This is where the point, two points uh, actually meet, evolutionary learning and prediction and testing. So this is where the spark of innovation is going to come on predicting defects. So CPDP is cross-project defect prediction. That is using a defect predictor that is prepared by someone else on some other software. I will use that to predict defects in my software. CPJIT is cross-project just-in-time defect prediction. I don't have time for building the model and all. I want uh, the release is coming up. I have to give up the software for testing. So in you know I just in time, just predict now. I don't care. Or maybe if you are developing something on Eclipse, Eclipse itself catches so many syntactical issues, right? Similarly, when you run your code, Eclipse kind of ID should be able to say, hello, your code, this module is likely to have 13 defects. That is just in time defect prediction. When the development is happening, the defect prediction is also happening. Oh, this config.python. Okay, expect seven defects from this. Okay, and believe me, three of them are going to be major. If something like that pops up in our window, we'll be able to immediately correct the issue then and there. That is the interesting field of cross project, just in time defect prediction. See, this looks like a magic, but believe, believe me when I say that there is a, it's all due to a process. There is a process for SDP. First, you have to look at data, defect data, and pre-process it. That is, remove unwanted data, label things correctly. Then, out of that, you select features. Here, the data, defect data consists of information like length of the code, how many functions are there, how many classes, how many methods, how many nested calls within the uh, class methods, how many variables, Yeah, what is the developer's productivity, developer's experience, the language, so many things we will have. Those are the features of the data. So out of that features, how many features you need to predict the defect? That is a classical research problem. Do I need, see, one of the debate which uh, we normally do is, hey, this uh, diff, this project, this was a Java project. Will it work on uh, Node.js? So is language a feature that we should worry about? The answer is uh, no, you can still predict the defect across languages. Language is not a major parameter here, according to the current research. You'll be surprised, no? it beats the common sense, isn't it? We think that uh, Node.js and all this um, Angular, these are difficult uh, modules, they are likely to have more defects because it is new, people don't know and all. But uh, the number of defects uh, predicted on these technologies compared to traditional Java and .NET kind of thing are similar, there's no difference. So language, you can afford to ignore the, the language part of it from your feature. Here feature means metrics, what we usually call as a matrix, here we are calling it as feature. So you need to reduce the number of uh, features, you pick up only those things which are going to help you predict the software defects. Okay. You would be surprised to know that length of code is still a major feature which will help you correctly predict the number of defects. Uh, we were of the, see, when we are writing programs in languages like COBOL and all those old technologies, the length of code was an important feature, but uh, not anymore because we have uh, this uh, object-oriented um, concepts and this dot, mon, dot concept, right? Class dot method dot invoke, that's it. You know, two lines of code does a lot of things. So, but still the line of code is a very good indicator of number of defects. Okay, 
so like this you reduce the number of features you take only the handful of features that will help you predict things and with that you build a model and train it and check its performance so that is how the uh, defect uh, prediction uh, goes to okay here is a colorful one should have shown this one first um the 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 heart of the thing is the um, the uh, the model and the training that happens in an iteration this is a typical ai uh, programming model so you feed in the uh, uh, training data and then uh, parameters and you run it uh, multiple times that uh, uh, so your learning is captured and the this big cylinder at the top gives you the necessary input data and once you have that you run your model on a testing data and get prediction results here we are getting three major outputs defective module list count module wise count and then vulnerable sections of the code and once you have those you evaluate your model how good it uh, actually uh, performed uh, so that you can take appropriate uh, business decisions so this is the generic model we trying to um, uh, improve over uh, the current research is happening with this model and we are focusing on all these areas for example there is a lot of focus on defect data so people are looking at available data models and uh, um, checking how good they are so i have slides for that so let me continue so uh, before i get into some more detail i just want to understand well, are there any questions at this time i know i said i will take questions at the end but if there are anything that is not obvious right now or which is making uh, understanding a little bit difficult we can take a couple of questions at this time and then uh, move on are there any questions uh, we have questions uh, mr mahesh but uh, we'll uh, we can take it in at the end of this sure okay fine okay so let me continue so defect prediction happens at many levels so uh, i started with this blue box i wanted to show box within a box within a box within a box but i did not have time so i just showed one box so excuse me for that um first thing is general software defect prediction which is you know just one time just for curiosity or you know you have a software you just want to know whether it is defective or not so one is a first one ignore the first one it is a very loose definition so you can do defect prediction across releases sorry within a release so let's say you are producing version 1 release 1 of your software okay so you can you will be doing many attempts to get it right isn't it so you will be hosting and checking hosting and checking so every attempt across every attempt you can predict the defect okay first time i'm hosting it i'm pushing for, through git okay git push heroku master okay now i'm looking at it okay there are 14 defects now let me uh, improve the code and let me once again do git push heroku master this time how many yeah, i reduced to 9 so you can do it within the release so that is called as intra release defect prediction then we have inter release hey we have released uh, version 1 of this software now i'm working on version 2 so how many defects i have i'm going to have in version 2 based on my performance in version 1 so if you train the model on version 1 of your software and then use it to predict defects in your version 2 then we are doing inter release defect prediction similarly cross project i am training my model on the defect data of some other project it could be mars orbiter or uh, isro's chandrayaan or icici's bank data bank uh, you know uh, e-commerce or amazon's e-commerce uh, app defect data i don't care i am taking that from the market or maybe it could be my own company's another project i am trying to train i'll i'll train my ai model on that project but i use 
I'm using it to predict defects in some other project. That is cross project defect prediction, CPDP. This is happening within the company only. Okay, so this is a very hot area for research. And then within company defect prediction across departments. So still I'm a large company. So the projects uh, done by uh, model and to predict uh, fine, but it's still within the company. So CPDP and WCDP, the these two are somewhat similar. I will use their data, train my model, and I'll predict. So this is idealistic scenario. Not many companies share, forget defect data. They don't, you know, we don't collaborate at all. You know, we are always suspicious of each other. And, uh, that is why you don't see much uh, reuse within the industry. When we were growing up in the system, we thought that reuse is going to be uh, a big thing. We thought, ah, these are all done by you know, other people, why I should reinvent the wheel? No, most of us still write the login component. Why? How many times I have to write the login component? <laughs> yeah, but still we do, right? Many, many things, error handlers we write. So many things we write. We could easily share them across, but uh, we are not open enough. You know, we cite uh, many obstacles, most of, most of the obstacles we quote are wrong. You know, we are just pretending, that's it. There's no spirit of collaboration across companies. If it happens, at least if we share the defect data, it will be awesome. Then we can build intelligent SDPs. Okay, uh, complicated slide, but there's nothing much to it. It's, it only, see, understanding any new system requires you to focus on the language part of it, the taxonomy. You learn the taxonomy, you'll get a grip on the subject. So this is just an introduction of various terminologies which I've already explained, a bit more graphical and a flow. Flow is nice in this one. So software fault prediction. See, we were using the term software defect prediction, but here is the taxonomy SFP. Then we have intra-release prediction, cross-project, again, you know, similar things, yeah. So this only um, highlights some of the terminologies used. So we skip this right now. So I said, how do you do predict defect prediction? You have to look at the metrics. These are called as features. So software metrics, the different types, the product related and process related. Then there are traditional ones, and then there are object oriented metrics, and there are new ones. Uh, so like this, so um, in the traditional ones, most of you might be familiar with some of the things like uh, source line of code, SLOC, function point, yeah, that is very computer science -y thing, not many people know. So cyclomatic com complexity, it's classic indicator of uh, uh, defect, not many people com compute, so if you have these uh, metrics, it will be really useful for predicting things. Um, this is just an introduction to the various kinds. See, not only on the product, you can collect on the process side also. How many times you have changed? How many changes occurred in your module? And uh, how many lines of code were deleted? How many files are there in your system? Okay, and uh, see personal commit sequence. You know, there's always one developer who is so nervous. You know, every time one change he makes, you know, he commits and then pushes it to Heroku and then there he sees the result, right? So the, I'm one of those kind of guys. So the, the number of times people commit, yeah. So revisions, number of revisions. So many things like that. They are from. They come from the process side of things. So the other other three top three boxes come from the product side of things. So all these are useful. Not only that, we need some meta information. That is information about the project. For example, under what context are you doing it? 
is it a public project is it a, is it a, how many functions in the morning how many classes are there yeah um, how old is this software how is, is this the 40th revision or the first revision so that's the maturity of uh, maturity maturity of things um, here another important point is at what level we have this defect and defect data is it at the project level or is it at the package level or class level or method level the number of lines of code okay if the question is how many lines of code are there if you answer 3 million then your answer is at the project level so you are giving me the loc lines of code information at the overall highest possible level but that cannot help me to estimate defect at method level because i don't know how many lines of code in uh, is, are there in uh, uh, in a particular method if you give me if i ask you the same question how many lines of code are there and if you answer it like this mm, i have overall 3 million lines of code uh, by the way i have uh, 30000 modules so then i can divide one by the other and think that okay fine these people have about 100 lines of code per method so it helps the more information you give the more the granularity better is the defect prediction also you should look at the data quality issues there will be lot of outliers missing values redundant irrelevant data all these issues it, it reduces its own set of uh, problems some of which are uh, shown on the screen for example class imbalance okay fine i'm doing cross project defect prediction i obtained mars rover project defect data but it is a very clean code so the only 10% of the code is defective but i am working with very amateur developers it is possible that 50% of my code is likely to be defective so there is a class imbalance right the mixture of ratio ratio of uh, clean you know defective versus clean is 1 is to 9 so i'm training the model with that kind of imbalance and i'm trying to put it on uh, try it on a project where the uh, uh, defect to non defect ratio is 1 is to 1 merely so that introduces its own set of problems and high, higher dimensionality that means this mars rover data has value for 100 metrics i have value for only 4 what do i do there is a mismatch so the quality of prediction goes down so you need to look at your data set as well okay yeah so now let's when we are talking about data let's talk about a little bit about it there are only five public data sets across 86 products okay and these are the those are the data these are the data sets do you recognize any indian company in this no We, because we are a software services superpower we are not software product superpower right we don't have you heard of any indian software product used across the world not really right then why do we call ourselves a software superpowers we should think about that so these are the people uh, these are the data sets available out there so they are also not clean only one uh, thing is clean okay uh, only one out of these is clean i don't want to tell which one it is <laughs> okay uh, so, so you need to do a lot of pre processing of data you need to normalize standardize clean up clean up clean up then again solve that uh, class imbalance problem then that heterogeneity problem this mars rover data could be for five projects of mixed up size mixed up technologies and mixed up contexts so this is heterogeneous data it's not clean it's difficult you have to sort that out um and uh, not all of them are properly labeled modules are uh, you know are not labeled so you have to cross check the modules whether the defective module was labeled as defective or not that you have to check 
a lot of clean up required in the data set similarly on the metric side lots of lots of metrics uh, standard ones are about 20 code related and complexity related uh, metrics c and k is this package you, sorry c and k this gives you these about six uh, metrics related to the product object oriented that so loc d still it helps the number of lines of code defective that's the that's the one which helps uh, counting the number of defects okay you can minimize metrics you have to minimize metrics otherwise your model becomes complex comp uh, complicated and then you can rank these metrics also for example should we uh, consider lines of code uh, ahead of number of methods or do you want number of methods to be given higher priority while modeling so that is feature ranking so you have to experiment with feature ranking and all and then you can the you can see the um, model performance uh, vary um to build the model there are a lot of varieties of techniques about 31 of them so so many classifiers we have first you you know these are the techniques used to classify models as defective and non defective see how many techniques okay and then uh, how do you evaluate uh, the performance of the model there are many uh, uh, f measure and g measure these are some of the uh, techniques used to check how perfect is your um, model not only that there are so many others here recall precision area under the curve g measure f measure accuracy and all so then you have to validate your model right so for that we use many validation techniques you know we hold out family is you know we use 50% of the data to train the model and remaining 50% to test the model then you have cross validation here also you you do it 10 times there are 10 into 10 fold that is you uh, create 10 folds 10 parts of your data use 1/10th of it to train and the remaining to test something like that so there are many many methods for validation as well so how are these models doing right now so so that's a very good question isn't it so after so much talking so much about uh, software defect prediction and all how are we doing some of the models are giving very good uh, very good performance there's a definition for what is high performance here the recall should be 0.75 precision and accuracy all three that means 75% of the classification should be accurate and precise and recall there are different definitions for this recall is the number of things that you have correctly identified over out of all the things that you have identified okay but this high performance is met in only 4% of the project that we are tested so still the accuracy is about uh, okay the model that i am trying it is about 79% accurate still not there so we have to do a lot of things and the performance is even worse when it comes to cross project defect prediction so we are successful on, in only 3.4% of the cases you might be wondering what kind of speaker he is you know he came and ta- to talk about ai and software engineering we thought uh, super duper things are happening and he is showing all this low performance thing see i'm <laughs> trying to tell you that this is a new field still things are going on we have to do a lot of work so my objective of today was to introduce that how difficult things are with ai you know we all talk about things and we copy code from google and then you we put up uh, a show but uh, real research is painful 
and this is the state of the art and it's also a tremendous opportunity if any of you want to do phd this is one area where you have plenty of problems in fact i have uh, listed about 19 uh, gaps in this area and i did only little bit of research that to part time research so my external examiner in phd said uh, the general belief is that we don't have problem statements in software engineering but here is a candidate who is putting up 19 gaps so he was surprised to know so if any of you are interested in uh, advancing this field this is a very rich area so it is possible to predict effects and count and to a reasonable degree of accuracy 79% or 80% accuracy is not bad yeah it is not good compared to 99.9 we understand but we are at least better than humans right better than your team lead okay so the to me it is a more positive uh, situation because there is a lot of opportunity to do things and some of the just in time part you know the case i spoke about i'm trying to uh, predict effects right in that time of development that is possible but the performance is not great what is rightify's dream in this and mahesh's dream you know? what is that we are trying to do here so we are trying to visualize the future I'm trying to build that my vision or the rightifies vision is to have something like a service like dpass that is defect prediction as a service so i imagine a, a cloud based service where you know, things are hosted on, on a public cloud uh, so that cloud has a Uh, a set of pre-trained uh, defect models and then uh, shared data sets which consists of lot of defect data and also model improvement application so different software development teams connect to this service and they get defect prediction in real time as a service so how are they going to use it so i have some uh, Some slides I'm not able to show. I don't know why. Maybe the platform got bored. It is straight away going to thank you slide. Hmm. Interesting. So let me open it from my paper. Actually, it's it's from I presented a paper. Uh, Okay, where is it? Publications. Yes. Yes. So, this thing full paper submission. Yeah, cloud-based. Cloud-based framework for cross-project software defect prediction. This paper is still under publication from past one year. That is one thing I don't like about academics. You guys take lot of time. why can't this be reviewed and published it's been one year since i wrote this paper and it is still under review okay so i could not show this slide on that platform so i am trying to show it here so this is how people uh, use this uh, cloud based defect prediction system so uh, so they log in register into this front end application it has a front end application here all these are the users so they log into this they select the model uh, they they select uh, the model because depending on the on the nature of the current project for which they are uh, uh, they want to predict the defects they choose the model and then they um, upload the code and they select the level at which they want the defects predicted is it at the overall project level or at the class level or the module level or the method level and then they run the defect prediction model and they get the details of the predicted defect now this defect data 
is saved and go back into improving the model see here we will predict the more defect and put it into this data set so that we can improve this model once again one of the pain areas was lack of availability of data right so here we can collect the uh, defect uh, prediction data uh, uh, in real time as and when users use it so that's it this is how they use it and there is another program called as a model improvement application its job is to look at the latest defect prediction experience and improve the model the defect prediction model so as you can see this is what is uh, our uh, dream you know, we want to develop and to put this uh, defect prediction as a service as a cloud application okay so we are working on that so this paper is the first step and in the back end we have uh, if any anyone wants to do internship with us uh, you know this is one of the nice problems that we can we can give you um i think there is something wrong here i can't show this slide so if you have any interest in this topic and if you want to help us uh, realize this uh, dream of developing defect prediction as a service or if you want to do any research in this area and if you have any thoughts uh, i'll be uh, I mean, i'll be very happy to interact with you and uh, discuss this uh, subject ah now it comes up okay so this is how they use it and so yeah this is what i wanted to talk about today i just wanted to tell you how things are in the area of uh, software engineering and uh, how ai can be used i i know i could have detailed out a lot of use cases but i wanted to make a general give a general description of the possible use cases and then elaborate one use case so that was my objective today so i hope uh, i've given you a glimpse of how ai can help software engineering and i've given you an idea about uh, how much of work is out there that is what this slide is showing on the left hand side yeah building this innovative bulb takes a lot of effort and uh, it has to be done in a collaborative way and you know it gone are the days where an innovator sits in one isolated area looks at the sky dreams and then comes out with a fantastic new idea they are very rare so collaborative research is the way forward so join hands with us let us create a new world of a new world of new possibilities in software engineering so that was my speech thank you very much for your patient listening um time now is 5 minutes past 4 we have some time for questions uh let us have uh, the questions the first question is uh, can ai be used to stop the spread of coronavirus um uh, see there is a quotation which is a bit slightly controversial so let me quote that uh artificial intelligence cannot defeat natural stupidity <laughs> right so it's a covid is a classic battle between ai and natural stupidity if people don't wash hands if the people ignore all the you know the government says don't crowd people say who are you to tell us we will you know hundred of us want to attend this wedding yeah because these two people want to get married and we want to enjoy the food so they go there without mask and you know this is natural stupidity has more power here what can ai okay jokes apart what can ai do for covid yeah, there are a lot of things ai can do for example it can predict the likely number of uh, 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 cases across uh, bbmp wards but many proposals have gone like that using ai data yeah and uh, i think ai was already used to predict estimate the number of people one person can infect 
someone said that it is 495 or so that means one person has the ability to infect 495 people i'm not sure how what that figure is but i believe ai was used to some extent so you can predict definitely ai can help uh, to see how the disease spreads you can identify vulnerable areas and vulnerable types of people i believe it can help the only thing is we need a lot of information sharing the data should be freely shared without data sharing it is not possible okay let us take the next question how does artificial intelligence impact our lives um like i believe that it is augmented intelligence it's going to help us to do our jobs better see my job is to develop software so if this ai can tell me where my software is going to be weak or produce uh, more defect it helps me right similarly if it can predict you know one of our interns showed a, a demo of her project in which they had predicted uh, pneumonia from x rays well it need not replace the doctor but at least if it can tell the doctor hey look uh, this um, uh, this patient is likely to have pneumonia i can see it from his x ray so then it helps the doctor right so ai is used first of all to remove all the repeated repeated boring roles like your uh, uh, loan status loan processing loan application processing these things can be done by bots and uh, and there are bots that give you primary care if you are not well it will come you know there are there are bots that can lift a patient from your from the bed and then uh, put them down you know they know where to hold the patient they are all they are used in australia i think so they, they are health care giving bots driven by ai they can help similarly uh, uh ai can help uh, drive complex uh, um, equipment and uh, vehicles that can prevent uh, accidents so many 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 positive ways in which ai can change our lives okay the next question sure what is the impact if uh, defect predictions go wrong uh, defect predictions yes they are the accuracy is still about 80 to 90% in best cases that to only in isolated conditions they are uh, very accurate so the, they will go wrong the the main objective of defect prediction is to test things better if you have a limited set of people for doing testing you can use the defect prediction data to allocate your testing resources you, you know if you have there are 100 modules in your project, project i need to know which one i should spend more effort on so defect testing can help uh, in those kind of uh, scenarios so when it goes wrong you are likely to waste some resources okay so the defect prediction is not defect removal so somebody has asked me hey if you can predict the defect why don't you remove it right so as of now if defect prediction goes wrong you will waste some testing effort but if you believe defect prediction results and fix only those defects and don't test the rest of it then you will be causing more more side effects Okay, let us uh, take the next question. Uh, will the impact be more than that of normal defects? The same. Sounds likely, I think. See, normal defects. It is possible that you may not even notice the normal defects. So, if the defect prediction identifies, then you will be extra. careful in looking into the module right so let's say there is an authentication module and the defect prediction says look 
based on my uh, inputs there should be at least four defects in it so then the tester will be keen to identify uh, so many number of defects that may not be the case in normal uh, you know compared to the normal normal testing like that's where it helps your testing that's why it is augmented intelligence right so i think uh, a scenario with defect prediction will be better than the normal wherein you don't have any indication at all when the testing the product goes to testing the testers will have zero knowledge about the defects they assume that every module every line is defective and they have to write test cases but with defect prediction you can do your job better if the tester knows that there are 13 critical modules that are likely to be more defective and uh, module 7 is likely to have 25 defects they can be better prepared so the scenario your testing scenario is much much better with uh, defect prediction in place the next question how ai is used in social media monitoring social media monitoring is one of the earliest uh, use cases for ai when lots and lots of people are tweeting about their thoughts about their products and all this uh, this, this thing called a sentiment analysis came up so the beauty was that uh, the twitter message is, has a limited uh, size 140 characters it, now it has increased but uh, there only still it is a small number and uh, each word you can look at it as a keyword and then you can identify the sentiment behind that keyword so when um, people did not like uh, a service or a product what kind of tweets they were putting up and what kind of words they were using and compared to the words that people were using when they were happy so with this sentiment analysis uh, the field picked up and now they can predict all sorts of things and even in recent elections people are able to predict uh, whether the candidate is going to win or lose based on the type of comments uh, uh, people are putting up on social media so here the general i think the question is asking about the how part okay the how part is you should be able to read the social media uh tweets and uh, messages that is your input and the technique used is uh, break it up into keywords and then uh, uh, classify the keywords as good or bad or you know sad or happy or whatever emotion that you want to attach and then you compare uh, uh, the child, the combination of keywords whether it is uh, moving towards a favorable decision or an unfavorable decision so probably you will use k means cluster or some algorithm to determine what is this tweet is all about is it a happy tweet or a sad tweet you can classify from that uh, monitoring yeah someone is angry they are posting something against someone again you can do keyword analysis here most of it is natural language processing so that's the technique uh, that i am aware of so there are, there are many more possible answers for example if you are amazon based on the review comments you can identify whether the product is good or bad and from the combine that with a star rating uh, you can do things and if you want to understand why people are returning their product and merchandise then you have to do a little bit of detailed nlp to understand top 10 reasons why people return your products There are many, many ways to use uh, AI in social media. Next, next question: so Which language is best for AI? Your mother tongue, because AI is your your thought process, right? You have to solve the problem in English or your language first, and then you implement it. But yes, the there is no right or wrong answer for this but i find uh, python to be much more useful because python has a lot of powerful libraries and the uh, ability of python to crunch numbers and uh, uh, to do statistics is awesome so i am a fan of python so my natural answer is python but uh, there is no such thing as a best language it's all you know uh, what is good for the uh, 
thing at hand. I'll give you one example, most recent from our own company. We started off uh, with the mean stack, that is MongoDB, Express, Angular, and, uh, and Node.js to solve, uh, uh, to build a self software for uh, elevator maintenance company. Then we understood, hey, wait a minute. They were asking for automatic scheduling, which is done best done in Python. So then we switched over the web part also to Python. So uh, this is a best fit for the solution in, on hand. It does not mean that this was the wrong choice of language. Uh, it is just now for this problem, this is the right language. So for AI, it cannot be a best language, but uh, yeah, Python might help in many situations. Similarly, there we have uh, Go as well. That's also another one. So there's no best one, but uh, it's a battle of uh, you know, it, it varies from context to context. But if you want to start, start with Python. That's my suggestion. Next one. Is that it? Seven questions? Okay, there are so many things on the live comments. Uh, difficult to identify questions from this. Can we make TikTok video through AI? Am I audible? Okay, sure. Okay. Am I audible? Can someone post a comment on the chat? I understand that the SIT dropped out. So if there are other audience, I can maybe answer questions. I see some questions here.
Okay, so if I'm audible, let me answer some of these questions. Uh, what about MATLAB? Yeah, why not? See, it's again a matter of uh, your your requirement on hand. If it has all the right kind of libraries, you can go for it. Usually, we have to build uh, some systems around your AI systems. For example, the web application, which delivers the result of your uh, AI system. So then you need a friendlier technology. So maybe you can try a mix of technologies, right? Your core powerful uh, piece of the AI using Python or MATLAB or something, and then make it as a module. And you call that module from other friendlier uh, systems like Angular. Angular is very good with the front end. Right, so you call your library uh, from that. So MATLAB is also is also nice. Uh, I don't know why people look for the best uh, language. I think they are looking from the employment perspective. Maybe they want to change their jobs or find new opportunities. That is why people want to know which is the best one, where to focus the energy on. It is not a definitely not a wrong question, but there are no right answers. That is a problem. OK, how AI handles missed data in data set and how accuracy is measured? Good question. So here, let me share my screen. Um, so here, I'm trying to show my, uh, yeah, this is my PhD work. So here, see, accuracy. There's a formula for this. Total positive plus total negative divided by all your observations. See, you can classify your observations as true positive and true negative, and false positive and false negative. See, when you measure something, it is possible that you got the truth correctly, and you ignore the truth as well. For example, if someone comes um, coughing to you, you're a doctor. If you identify that, look, you identify and tell the patient, like, look, you have some throat problem because you are coughing. So that is the case of true positive. Let's say the patient has come and is not coughing. And you tell that person, patient that, look, you, uh, you have some throat problem because you are coughing. That is false positive. Because you gave a positive identification that the patient has cough, but that is not the case. So that is a uh, false positive. That means you have diagnosed the case as, uh, as the patient has cough, but in reality, he doesn't. The other, the, then the two scenarios are opposite. False positive is for false negative. The patient is coughing. You are telling him that there are no throat problems. That is a dangerous situation, isn't it? That is false. That is false positive similarly you have false negative okay the patient is not coughing his throat is absolutely fine he is singing actually but you are telling him that hey you have a throat problem so so he can classify all your findings like this so accuracy is measured as a ratio of how many times you correctly classified the truth your declaration of truth whether, it, whether the result is positive or not. Okay. Your declaration of the truth. So it is TP plus TN divided by sum of all your observations. So that was your, that is how accuracy is defined. Uh, how AI handles the missed data set. AI cannot handle the missed data set. You have to pre-process and write boring traditional code to fix that thing. For example, if your data set has missing column values, you have to call the FILNA, F-I-L-L-N-A, data frame dot FILNA, to, and then fill those uh, uh, missing things with not applicable value. Or you have to put that default value of zero or false or something like that. That is not AI. It is boring, common programming. Okay, is there any other technology which will do jobs, tasks better than AI? See, AI is not a technology. If you think about it, it is not just one thing. AI has 
so many fields have contributed to AI. So let me just pull up that. How many co fields contribute to AI? So many uh, knowledge areas are there in AI. Okay. Uh, so it is not at all. Um, uh, see, just uh, let me share the screen. So don't look at it as a technology. Okay. It is not a technology where you can pay a coaching center some uh, uh, money and uh, uh, buy that or use that. See here, it's a multi brick foundation. Okay, AI, there is philosophy. Okay, see, ration, loss of rationality and formal reasoning. What Aristotle said in 384 BC, that is helping our AI today. Okay, dualism, materialism, empiricism, principle of induction. Yeah, all these are philosophies helping AI. Similarly, maths is obviously helping AI. Algorithm, the concept of algorithm, Boolean logic, theory of NP completeness, probability theory, statistical and bias rule. Bias rule came up in 1702 to 1761. That is helping today in mathematics. Then we have economics, the decision theory. Is it defective or non-defective? How do you take that uh, decision? Operations research, yeah, that's from economics. Similarly, neurosciences, we build artificial neural networks. So we simulate a nerve cell. So that is coming from neuroscience. Similarly, psychology, you know, human vision and all that perception we have perceptron and all that right knowledge agent so this is the contribution of psychology similarly control theory and cybernetics linguistics computer science of course yeah all these have uh, contributed to ai so don't look at it as just one better technology of course if you want to use ai for uh, say doing a payment to your bank then what is the fun in that it's a wrong treatment, right? It's all application. Yeah? There are things suited for certain things and things not suited for certain things. Okay, eighth question came up. How can AI help in detecting defects in totally new projects with new requirements? Yeah, this is a classical case of cross-project defect prediction. Here, totally new requirement means what? The defect is a defect. You are going to construct an answer for your new requirement using the same way in which you build software. So how do you satisfy a new requirement? By breaking it down into input process output, right? You will, you will implement that new requirement, totally new or whatever it is, using traditional methods of input processing the input in order to generate the output. So there is nothing new in this computer science, isn't it? See, all processes can be broken down into read, write, and update, isn't it? Create, that's why we have only four verbs in uh, HTTP, right? Get, to post, patch, yeah? and which is the fourth one? Release, uh, delete, is it? Yeah. So everything boils down to input process output. So it's the same constructs you use. It's the same keywords, right? If you're doing it in Python, you're gonna use the same if, for loop, while loops, conditions, and all that. Okay, so the goal is if you have data of similar project or dissimilar, even dissimilar projects will help defect prediction. Okay, what are the different types of probabilistic models useful in software defect prediction? So there are so many techniques. Uh, uh, about 31 different techniques are used uh, to defect uh, in defect prediction. Yeah. So I'll just bring that up. Uh, there are so many classifiers. Some of the classifiers use uh, probabilistic uh, reasoning. So if you see here in this, yeah, there are so many, uh, so many you can you can think of here. Some of them are straight away logistic used, and then this partial decision tree. There are so many, uh, so many. Uh, most of them use uh, probabilistic reasoning. So these are popular 31 tests. See, you also use Bayesian network, which is highly probabilistic. 
in nature and genetic programming still uh, it uses a little bit of probability there as well yeah um, associative rules you can apply probability to determine which rule to apply and how to associate there are some pure statistical methods like this logistic regression the average counting average voting these are probably more statistic and less probabilistic in nature what type of models you suggest suitable in ai for real data set of huge size uh, not able to understand this question what type of model you suggest suitable in ai for real data set of huge size the ai data sets are supposed to be real because if you use unreal data set then you will be in trouble okay so real data set i have answered huge size i don't know what is a huge size what makes up a huge size but uh, the expectation from ai side is the data set has to be huge the higher data you have the more data you have the more uh, better it is there is no one single model that deals with your huge data size you have to describe see what is a model it's a representation of reality isn't it so if you get a huge data set you have to describe it using a handful of uh, features right that's what uh, they choose the features which represent the model okay and uh, you work with only those features in fact uh, the opposite is encouraged what is encouraged is let me share my screen once again we, what did we say in the sdp process we said reduce the dimensions right we said it you have to choose only a limited number of uh, features to build your model so just because the data set is huge you should not choose too many features in it okay the feature reduction you should use less number of features the actual number of rows in your data set doesn't matter what matters is how many features you are uh, using to model or represent that huge data set so if if there are 100 million rows in it but only two columns then it is not a huge data set in my opinion it is huge in rows not in numbers if there are 1000 features and 1 million rows then you are in trouble you have to choose only 5 or 10 which will help you that's where you need to reduce the feature yeah reduce the number of features so huge data set choose your future features carefully and ignore the number of rows the the program is going to handle the number of rows you have to minimize the number of columns or the features that you select select only those features that matter okay for example if i am doing defect prediction the gender of the programmer does it matter no whether it's a female or a male programmer does it matter no your data set might contain that so drop it the nationality of the developer no drop it maybe you know you, you can't bring up an argument an indian developer is much better than a british developer that is why the uh, nationality matters then you have a problem right what if an indian is sitting on the british side what if he has taken uk passport and <laughs> how does it help so nationality gender there are so many i am giving trivial examples but you can identify things that doesn't matter so it is strictly you be strict and eliminate those things and represent the model using only handful of features then you will be able to deal with your huge size size is not a problem next question uh, should ma'am should i pick it up from the live comments or are you going to put it up here how do we do that question now if we categorize with severity do we write code for assemblers to predict defect 
Uh, see, the severity classification is one of the desired features in software defect prediction. I want to I want to use AI to identify how bad is the uh, defect. That is a severity classification. Do we write code for assemblers to predict defects? Uh, no. Yes, you can. Maybe for Python interpreter itself, you can write a defect predictor. That's a good thought. You can do that. For example, see the the assemblers and interpreters they work at the language feature level, but the defects come from the application side of things. Okay, so I'm not talking about syntactical defects here. Uh, so. It's an, yeah, this is a nice question. We need to think about this. It, if it is possible, in my opinion, I would answer this question in positive. I would say yes, if possible, we have to write a um, defect prediction model for uh, these uh, interpreters like Python. And if it becomes a part of the language, it's nothing like it. It's awesome. Yes, next question. While the next question come up, let me pick up one of these things here, some of the earlier questions. Does AI play a role in Internet of Things? Uh, Internet of Things is more of uh, interaction between sensors. So you can collect data from those sensors and then apply AI to identify what you want. To so if because those sensors are small devices having very limited memory and all, right? AI requires uh, good processing power and you probably asking these tiny sensors to do AI is a bit of a uh, too much. So you can collect all the IoT data, consider that as a data set and then do your AI magic on top of it. That's how I would say things could, should be. Okay, MATLAB, okay. How can AI help in predicting performance of an industry? Okay, so this is, we are talking about how is the banking industry doing? How is the uh, medical industry doing? How is software engineering doing? And how is uh, professional sports like basketball is doing? Yeah. See, you have to look at your AI problem in terms of a model. How do you describe your banking industry? Is it the uh, share price of top 10 banks? Or is it the total number of um, unpaid loans? Or is it the number of credit card transactions per day? So everything in AI boils down to a model. And what are the features that you use to build that model. So if you can describe an industry in terms of five or six features, then you can model that industry. Once you have data for those five things, you can train the model and then uh, and then um, and then judge the industry based on AI performance. Okay, question 12 has appeared. Does AI play a role in the Internet of Things? I won't say that. AI 13, is there a better te technology which will do the jobs task better than AI technology? I just said that uh, there are more than 18 different fields participate in AI, right from fire, you know, psychology to computer science to neural networks to biology to so many other things. So. It is not a technology. It is a combination of so many. It's, you can't say that it is one technology like Python. To me, Python is a technology, piece of technology. 
mean stack is a piece of technology angular is a piece of technology a database is a piece of technology ai is a technique you can implement a technique using any technology so the language is very important there ai is a way of doing things it's a collection of uh, different processes which can be implemented using different technologies so better than ai sometimes yes ai is an overkill see if you are roaming around holding a hammer everything looks like a nail to you right you feel like banging on it right so if ai is the only tool you have even to log in you will use ai right so it's uh, you have to use the right technology for the right thing yes there are cases where ai is an absolute wrong technology or wrong thing to use yes so there could be alternate technology where you don't need ai okay for it depends on what task you have on hand okay yeah question 13 answered question okay let me pick up one more how can we know that what type of data is suitable for ai Have, see the data should have see like i said you need to build a model that is the objective in ai to build a model you need features so your data should have values for those features isn't it let's say you are building a model to predict the performance of the class how many people are going to pass in this okay what all what all data you need you need the average performance of the student average performance of the faculty and the average difficulty of the question paper right these are the three three let's say these are the three parameters on which you are building the model now if you have a data set which does not give answers to all three then you have a wrong data set so one of the characteristics of data is it should have values for the desired features and it should not have too many undesired features for example students gender how does that matter it is not required right so it should have less of what is not required and more of what is required and then there should be at least uh, some 30000 to 50000 cases for example we were trying to detect cracks in a chimney so we don't we got 60000 pictures of chimney so if you are detecting pneumonia you need or if you are detecting covid you can't analyze 100 samples and say hey i have written a covid detector ai based covid detector no not enough 100 so if it is 1 lakh yeah then we are talking something sensible right so the characteristics of data is it should be complete in terms of rows it should have things that you need you should not have things that you don't need and it should have sufficient number of rows So those are the characteristics of data, and of course you should own that, and it should be real data, real in the sense that it should not be artificially created. Okay, it should be as real as possible to the real world. Otherwise, your AI will give results which do not apply to the real world. Okay, that was the last question in this list. any other questions or we have overshot the time i think 445 so over to team sit i'm happy to answer more questions uh, you can send it to me over my email um i'm available on linkedin any other questions did i miss any question
Okay, I'm getting many thank you messages. So yes, it, okay. Which language in AI would you suggest for a beginner? Yen. English is what I recommend to understand the AI. And yeah, I've already said I'm a fan of Python. So maybe Python, MATLAB, this might help. Can AI be dangerous? Who coined the term artificial intelligence? Okay, AI can be dangerous. And uh, there are many cases where uh, AI has been proven to be dangerous. In the recent experiment uh, of uh, self-driven car, uh, the car applied brakes as soon as uh, it detected uh, uh, an artificial fixture as a human. So it misinterpreted things and it gave a wrong, uh, uh, wrong, wrong output. Yes, AI can be dangerous. So the term artificial intelligence was coined uh, in 1950, in a, in a conference, um, so it is not one person, it is a set of people who, uh, who coined the word uh, artificial intelligence. So, yeah, so uh, John McCarthy is. I think some people attribute it to John McCarthy. There are, there are plenty of definitions, but first time it was used in the around uh, 1950, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, any yeah, other questions? I think uh, all questions are answered. Okay. So we have come to the end of the session. Thank you, Mr. Mahesh, for the wonderful session that we had today. Your talk has created new awareness in us to explore AI in software uh, engineering domain. So we seek your expert and look forward for your continued support on similar occasions in future. Thank you once again. Thank you for having me uh, on board. And uh, yeah, I welcome people to do internships with us, get in touch. You know, pick up some problem statements and experiment. So we are always open for uh, people, especially from SIT and those who come with SIT recommendations. <laughs> they be given priority. Yes, my alumni are here to do whatever it takes. Thank you for having me. Definitely, we'll make use of this opportunity yeah. and see that uh, we take the internships. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. I thank all the participants for joining this session. I request each one of you all to provide your valuable feedback on this session by using the link sent to you. So let us join back tomorrow at 11 a.m. to listen to Mr. R. Subramanian, advisor and former uh, Vice President, Huge Communication India Private, India Limited, for a talk on new trends in satellite communication. Thank you, Ananda. So I'm just typing my uh, two email IDs here in the chat. You can write to any of those two email IDs. Someone asked one last question. Can you do online internships? Yeah, we can, but it is slightly difficult. We can give it a try. OK, some people are doing uh, one or two problem statements with us. We can discuss. So get in touch. There are no generic answers for this. We will try to uh, work together. Okay, so thank you very much once again. Have a nice day, nice evening, and uh, good good luck to the rest of the webinars and this great initiative. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Much. Thank you. Thank you.